Did you just acquire an NFT? Are you asking yourself if you're now the proud owner of a JPEG? Did you just mint a native token on Cardano? Does that mean you made an NFT? In this video, we'll explain why both of these statements are not necessarily true and shed some light on what is what. Hey, my name is Niels and I'm non-fungible. Today, I'd like to take the time to explain how CNFTs work, what they are, and what they are not. I also want to clear up some common misconceptions that are floating around on Twitter and elsewhere inside and outside the community. I will explore with you how to mint a CNFT in various ways, what the differences between these methods are, and we'll look at the components that make up an NFT on Cardano in the first place. Before we begin, let us clarify the terms we'll be using. Because if you want to really have a conversation about anything, shared terminology is essential. You probably know what NFT stands for, but we're gonna go and make it crystal clear anyway. NFTs are non-fungible tokens. Okay, so we have three words in here. Let's focus on the easy ones first, and we'll start at the end. Token. We'll just assume you know what that means, but we can technically use object, entity, item, or thingamabob. In the end, a token is just a symbolic representation of something else. It can be digital or physical. And then there is non, the first word, which we assume negates whatever is coming next. And herein lies the rub, since our last word is in the middle and it's fungible. Not quite something I personally used in everyday language until I got into cryptocurrency. Your mileage may vary, maybe you work in banking or at the US Mint, but I assume that is not the case for the majority of you. So let's explore what fungible means for just a second. Here's two definitions from Merriam-Webster. One, being something, such as money or a commodity, of such a nature that one part or quantity may be replaced by another equal part of quantity in paying debt or settling an account. Or two, capable of mutual substitution. This is probably easiest to understand when we apply words to real life contexts. Fiat money is fungible. It means that every symbolic dollar is identical. If you have $20 and I have $20, we have the same tokens. This is the same for any other currency, yen, euro, rupees, and so on. It makes life extremely easy when buying groceries. We have to understand though, that this concept of interchangeable is purely based on the intended usage scenario. What does that mean? I'll show you. This is $1. This is also $1. They are fungible when it comes to paying for your rent. Your landlord doesn't care which of them you give him. But wait a second. Just found another dollar four quarters. Coins. Your landlord will accept this as well, at least if they're accepting cash. Fungible. But these dollars are not identical. Need proof? Check out the serial number. Let's check out this one. Let me make it even clearer. You don't think they're identical now, do you? If I throw four quarters at you, you might get slightly more agitated than when I'd attempt that same thing with a dollar bill. A collector will think the same way. If your coin has a specific imperfection, it is usually still fungible. But the value, depending on what kind of imperfection we're talking about, will be significantly different. So what makes something a non-fungible token? If we both have one of these, they cannot be simply swapped, since the membership information on it makes it unique. It's got my name and address on it, and potentially like a membership number. Imagine, in another example, I had a holofoil Charizard and you had one. I doubt you'd think they are interchangeable if I tear a piece of mine off while yours is in almost mint condition in a sleeve. But when we play a round of Pokemon, PS, I have never played Pokemon, so you just probably wipe the floor with me, both our cards will have the same stats and in-game effects. They are, in that respect, fungible. Art is often non-fungible because reproduction is almost impossible in the same way. Imagine, 
the artist making the exact same brush strokes to achieve the exact same painting? Impossible. But again, only conceptual. Let's think about photos. A printed photo, on the other hand, is hard, but not impossible to tell from another copy of the same photo. Here the subject and how the scene is captured is probably more important and the unique part, not necessarily the medium. You can see the answer, fungible, not fungible, is not always black and white. Let's transfer this over to the blockchain. On Cardano, every ADA is identical. And not just dollar bill identical, but virtually indistinguishable from each other. There's no serial number, there's no signature, nothing. They're fungible tokens through and through. Now, since the beginning of the Mary era, which launched on 1st of March 2021, we also have something called native tokens, or more generally called multi-asset support. This is one of the monumental differences between Ethereum and Cardano. If you want to have your own currency within the Ethereum ecosystem, you will have to write an ERC-20 token smart contract in Solidity, or an ERC-721 for an NFT. While this is normally not super complex, it is very easy to introduce mistakes. Many token builders just copy and paste existing contracts in the hopes that everything is solid. On Cardano, tokens are native, which is the reason why we have fungible tokens and NFTs on our blockchain since more than six months without even having smart contract capabilities deployed. It is ridiculously easy to make a new token of any kind and pretty much risk-free. Okay. So we have NFTs since March, which we lovingly call CNFTs because they stand out from the crowd with how native they are. And some of them, like the Berry NFTs from the Berry Pool, were minted minutes after the capabilities were enabled, which makes them fairly sought after at this point. But what do they actually look like? Do they have serial numbers? First, let's spot the difference between a fungible token on Cardano and a non-fungible token. Wolfram made some cellular automata into NFTs at the end of July, and they auctioned them off a few weeks later. Turns out they did not quite match the definition of an NFT. Here's why. We'll use the fantastic tool pool.pm to visualize an asset on the blockchain. I've stored a link to one of those Wolfram NFTs, so I'll simply navigate to it and voila, here it is. We have a few different sections here that represent various components of the token. Here in the URL, we can see a token identifier or name. Then at the top of the page, we have a display name, that something that's a little bit more readable. Then we have the asset fingerprint. Then we have the policy ID, which I'll elaborate about in a bit. We have a quantity of tokens, and we have a mint date, which is the time the token was created. On Pool PM, we oftentimes also have a visualization, which is based on the last relevant component, which is the metadata. Now, can you guess why this is not technically an NFT? Right! This token exists 20 times in this exact form, with no way to tell it apart from any other token of the same kind. This here is a fungible token with a quantity of 20. If it were a real NFT, this quantity would have to be 1. Let's take a look at one of my actual NFTs. Here's one. You can see the quantity is 1. Even though of this particular video or batch, as many were made, as there were Plutus pioneers. Each one of the NFTs is unique. In this case, it has a name with a number attached to it to tell them apart, as well as some unique information in the metadata. Most importantly, the fingerprint is one of a kind and can be considered equivalent to a serial number. But again, only if the quantity is one. CNFT creators, however, often add their own serial number that is more readable, either in the display name, metadata, or token name. For example, sequential numbers. Sometimes those reflect the minting order, other times some other aspect of ordering that is unique to the project. So we covered display name, fingerprint, the token quantity, and it's clear what the mint date is. Leaves us with the two remaining, and in my opinion, most important components to be explained the policy ID, and the metadata. The policy ID is an identifier and reference to a script called the policy script. It is really less a script in the way a developer would use it as something to execute, but more as a collection of rules that need to be followed for minting and burning the tokens belonging to the policy. Here's an example policy script. It uses the JSON format, not to be confused with the other JSON, and JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. 
is simply a way to represent, store and transmit some sort of human-readable structured data. In this script, there is the type, which tells us which of the following conditions need to be fulfilled for someone to be able to use the policy. In this example, all means all conditions need to be fulfilled. The first of the two conditions listed below is a before, which means that the policy script can absolutely not be used anymore after the referred to slot number has elapsed. We also call this a time locked policy because it locks at the point in time denoted by the slot ID. The second item below is the public key of the signature that is allowed to mint tokens under this policy. There are also additional capabilities that I'm not going to show you in detail, but you can imagine a policy that I create in 2021 that will not be able to mint anything before the 1st of January 2022. And it might require two signatures instead of just one. Imagine two artists collaborating and wanting to ensure the other one does not create NFTs without the other person agreeing. With smart contracts, minting policies can now also be written in Plutus, the Cardano smart contract language, enabling even more complex scenarios. We now know what a policy defines and each token will have a policy ID. If you buy an NFT or sell it, you now have a way to confirm that the NFT is actually generated by the right entity. CNFT projects often publish their own policy IDs on their websites to indicate which assets are officially associated with them and to allow people and marketplaces to detect fakes. Because of the signature requirements defined in the policy, you can be confident the NFT is legit. The only case in which this would not be sufficient is if the creators of the policy were careless with their private keys, which could potentially allow a malicious user to mint new tokens or burn existing ones. Once you have a policy ID, you can start minting and burning tokens. Minting is the creation and burning means destroying tokens. Here's an interesting fact to consider though with what I said before. Unless you have the ability to generate your own policy, you might have to rely on a third party to do that for you. This includes tools like nftmaker.io and its equivalent pro version. Other websites that would also fall into this category would be cardanonativetoken.com, easycnft.art, or artano.io. I'll link them in the description below in case you want to check them out. Depending on how the website works, you might not have the option to provide your own policy or even your own signature. This means in many scenarios where the artist does not have the technical abilities to create signing keys and policies, they are using a custodial CNFT minting service. What that technically means is that the service is actually the owner of the keys that are used to make the CNFTs and you allow them to create them for you. If you don't intend to create only one-offs where each mint has its own policy, or if you want to reuse a policy for multiple projects, be sure to talk with your minting service provider ahead of time, if that option exists. You can also roll your own minting if you're running a full Cardano node, but it is technically a little bit more involved if you intend to make a bigger project, if you intend to make a thousand mints and you know different metadata. So you'll have to hook up your website to your minting process or ordering process, etc. All that alone could fill a whole video. Maybe someday. One last thing. Always verify the policy ID before buying a CNFT. If you're buying on a marketplace like token.io or cnft.io, they are making every effort to maintain a somewhat centralized list of verified policy IDs submitted by the respective artists. But in the end, you are the one that will be stuck with a fake should they make a mistake. So go ahead and verify. I know, I know, you've been patiently waiting and you're just here to learn this one thing. Do you own this JPEG now? I'll give you the short answer first and then we can dig in. The short answer is most likely you do not own a JPEG. You might be like, why? What did I just buy then? Well, a token. Commonly, this token comes with a bunch of associated data that we call metadata. Here's example metadata for the only space but that I own. Obviously, since our stake pool Hazel supports kitten fostering and we donate to cat shelters, our space butt is a cat. Let's take a look at it on our visualization tool PoolPM first. In this example, you can see the image right away and then at the bottom some form of metadata. But that is not the true form of the metadata. The data we'll be looking at is associated with the minting transaction of the token. An interesting side note here is that when you send your NFT around, you're usually not sending its metadata along. 
They're not changing, so it would be a waste of fees because transaction fees are based on the amount of bytes that are sent. We can find the mint transaction by taking our NFT fingerprint and feeding it into Cardano Scan IO or another blockchain explorer. Then we'll hop to the mint transactions tab, click on the transaction hash and on the metadata tab over there. There we click on the mysterious 721, a technical detail I won't get into right now. And ta-da, there's our metadata. Who would have thought? It's JSON. No, the other one, get out of here. This is the final piece of our NFT puzzle. The metadata can contain arbitrary data you wanna associate with the token as an artist. It could be rarity levels, traits, names, URLs to different representations and anything else you can dream of. Cardano trees store a mini website in its metadata. Unsigned algorithms store a reference to the source unsig that contains the algorithm to generate the unsig visualization, as well as the parameters to feed that algorithm. And our spacebud? Does it contain a JPEG? Nope. It contains a reference to a decentralized storage system called IPFS, which stands for Interplanetary File System. Unfortunately, I can't spend more time to explain the details of that in this video. So what PM, our visualization tool, and other visualizations of your NFT do is actually display this image that is hosted elsewhere. Your token has the metadata to do that and is your proof of ownership. But normally, it doesn't contain the image itself. Why is the image not simply stored in the metadata? That is a last unsolved mystery, isn't it? It's quite simple. Images can take up a lot of space, and there are NFTs that are videos, as we saw before. I might not make any friends trying to put a 10-hour loop of Neon Cat into my CNFT. The Cardano blockchain is not designed to store large amounts of data, same as most other blockchains. They function mostly as a ledger of transactions and metadata. And the metadata of a minting transaction on Cardano is currently limited to 16 kilobytes. So yes, someone could embed a small image encoded in the metadata but the content would be severely hamstringed for most projects. That's why many image-based projects store a reference instead of the actual thing. Sorry, that JPEG is not in your wallet. Exactly because of those limitations though, we will see the rise of centralized and decentralized metadata providers on Cardano in the near future. Our spacebot, for example, has four traits, chestplate, jetpack, covered helmet, and snorkel. And it was of the type cat. What if we want to provide this information in 50 different languages so that NFT can be understood by a non-English speaker? For this and various other reasons, new systems are being built to accommodate our growing hunger for CNFTs. One last thing if you're an artist or a developer creating a CNFT. While there is no fixed format on how to structure your metadata that is enforced anywhere, there are emerging standards that I highly recommend you follow. This way, you ensure that existing visualization tools, for example, know where to find your image or other data, like embedded HTML and JavaScript or SVG. The CIP25, the Cardano Improvement Proposal 25, defines such a standard and is already being used by many people and projects. I'll provide a link to it in the description below. I hope this video clarified Cardano NFTs for you at least a little bit and maybe helps to create a shared understanding for new faces in the Cardano community. Let me know what you thought in the comments below, and I'd love for some color suggestions for the background lighting in the next one. Consider liking and subscribing if you got value out of this, and if you want to make my day, delegate to Hazel and save a cat. Until next time, stay frosty.